Hello. Hey. Oh. Happy Thursday. Almost the weekend. Hey, Tyler. Hey, Adriana. Hey, Reese. Hi, everyone. I guess we could start with introductions. Sounds good. I will volunteer Tyler. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Uh oh. Oh, there you go. Tyler. <laughs> well, I guess um I'll I'll go real quick then. Um, my name is Reese. I am a senior developer relations engineer at New Relic. Um, I primarily work in the open telemetry and user working group with Adriana, actually. Um, and I used to work with Tyler as well. Um, he's part of the Collector Sig, but I'll let him do his own intro. But yeah, we're very excited to be here. And um, Adriana, who are you? Um, I am Adriana Villela. I work at LightStep, which is part of ServiceNow. I am a senior developer advocate. Um, been in the observability space for a couple years now. Um, working, doing a lot of work in open telemetry with Reese in the hotel end user working group. So super stoked to be here. Tyler, welcome back. Hopefully my mic is working. Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. Hi, my name is Tyler Helmuth. I'm a senior software engineer at Honeycomb, uh, and I spend most of my time contributing to open source software. I am a maintainer of the uh, OpenTelemetry Collector Helm Charts, a maintainer of the uh, OpenTelemetry Collector Contrib, and a, an approver of the OpenTelemetry Operator. Oh, yes, the operator. So I know we have kind of an outline um, just to help keep us structured a little bit. Um, we wanted to chat about, you know, what is open telemetry? Um, what are the benefits for you um, as a user? Why, basically, yeah, why you might interest, be interested in using open telemetry? Um, but we also welcome questions um, either specifically around specific components of the project, so like the collector. Um, I know we get a lot of questions about that from end users generally, um, but if you have questions about implementation or adoption, we can definitely see if we can help um, or help direct you to the right place. So yeah, I guess we can chat about, I mean, I, I'm assuming if you're listening in, you might have some idea of what open telemetry is, but we can also just go over real quick I also don't want to dominate the conversation. I have a bad habit of doing that sometimes. So I'm going to let one of you take take it away. All right. Uh, so what is open telemetry? Uh, I can, let's, well, I want to say what it's not, but I'll, we'll get back to that. Open telemetry is, a, is an open uh, source solution for generating telemetry data. Um, right now, the types of data that it can generate are um, traces, which are made up of spans, uh, metrics, and logs. Those are the three signals that OpenTelemetry supports, um, like officially. There's some discussion of like uh, some other signals, like profiling, um, being brought into the project. And I think there's an OTEP for it, but right now those are like the big three. Um, what it's definitely not is a backend. Um, it will never be a database. It'll never be a UI. Um, it's all about um, creating the data and moving it along. Uh, it's also not a query language. Um, Open Telemetry doesn't provide any solution on how to interact with the data like once it's like in rest in someone's database. Um, it's only about generating that data and getting it to um, whatever backend you choose. Yeah, so that being said, um you do have to choose somewhere to send the generated telemetry to, um, either using, you know, open source um, backends like Yeager, Prometheus, um, or a proprietary backend like one of ours. Um, uh, I believe there's something called, 
Oh, maybe I'm making this up. Okay, never mind. Let me look into it and then and then I might share it. I thought we have within the project this um, ability to send data somewhere that is not like a specific backend. I saw I mean, a very standard out. <laughs> yeah. There's also a really cool tool I saw recently. I think that someone is, is donating around um, like improving local development with traces. So being able to send, um, having your, your, um, your like app on your desktop, like that you're developing in real time, like have it generate traces and like visualize those traces in some way, but it's not like a production, like at rest, like permanent visualization tool. Um, it's very much like local development tool. Yes, definitely just for yeah, testing which one you're purposes. Talking about. I think, let me see. It's, um, let me grab the name for it because we are discussing it internally as well. Is it the hotel desktop viewer? Yeah, that's the one, that's the one. But I, so I found out from Ted yesterday that the collector team is apparently working on a collector viewer slash pipeline debugger. So, um, so, cause I know there had been talks about donating the desktop viewer to Otel, but because there's work being done from within the collector team on that, I guess there's probably no need. Wait, what is that one called again? Yeah, the, I don't know that one. <laughs> hotel oh, desktop the, viewer? No, the hotel desktop viewer. I don't know what the collector, the collector one, one is. that year. Yeah, this like Ted said he just found out like yesterday. <laughs> oh, let me I can send I can send a link to it. Ooh, let's see. And for those is someone, something that we can share with anyone who's joining or can we share that link easily? So we do have a link and um, we have someone who will- Sounds like our host will share it. Yes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but either way, the, the general statement is uh, the back end, like open telemetry will never be a back end. The two things that were just discussed were are all development tools um, and like debugging tools. Uh, it's not uh, like another open source project uh, like Jaeger is, is a format for generating telemetry, but also a, like a tool that you can use to visualize your telemetry. And that's an like, important part of that project. Uh, open telemetry has taken the stance that that is not an important part of it. Yeah. Uh, and so you wouldn't expect to see something like the Jaeger backend in open telemetry. Yes. And so, you know, the biggest like advantage I think for an end user is that it gives you freedom from being locked into a specific proprietary backend. Um, you can export your data. You can instrument your applications once with open telemetry and easily send your data to whoever, wherever you would like, um, multiple places even. You can split up where your traces go, where your metrics go to different backends um, and all you have to do is change the exporter endpoint um, in your config, and you can easily change where your data gets sent to. So I think that's one of probably like the biggest draw that I hear from end users. Um, do we want to talk about like distros? About <laughs> distros? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, vendor distros. I know that's been like um, a topic that's come up of interest. Recently. I'm kind of curious about that because I've heard of distros, but I don't know like exactly what. Like, is it that everyone basically has their own implementation of like the collector that does like special things specific to their backend? Is that the idea? Yeah. So when, when if anyone ever says the word distro, I think the at least with regards to open telemetry, that's all I can speak to. Uh, the I think most of the time they're talking about whose collector distribution are they using. Um, it's not limited to the distribution. Like um, anyone could take the, the instrumentation libraries for like .NET or Java or 
or go or whatever and like add wrappers around them and then redistribute that code. It's open source. So like, that's okay. Like you're allowed to do that. Um, but like most of the time, and, and it's mostly encouraged to just like try to use the, try to use the upstream stuff when you can use the distribution of the instrumentation when you can't for the collector, it's, it's different. Um, so the collector, maybe we should talk really fast about what the collector is. The oh, collector yes. is an observability pipeline. Um, it's a, uh, it's job is to receive data, process the data and export the data. Um, it can receive data from many different sources. It can receive all the signals, traces, metrics, and logs. It can process all that data. It can process it in different pipelines. And then it can export all that data. And it can export it anywhere you want. It could export it to your favorite vendor. It could export it to standard out. It could export it to a file. It could export it to whatever. Um, and so like all the data comes in, process all the data comes out. Um, and the way that it does that is it's made up these things called components. So there's different receivers. There's the OTLP receiver. It knows how to receive open telemetry's um, specification format, OTLP. There are exporters like the OTLP exporter or the OTLP HTTP exporter. The first one exports gRPC. The second one exports HTTP and it exports in the OTLP format. Then there's processors on the inside like the transform processor that let you mess with your data, maybe change an attribute. Um, there's a sampling processor that lets you sample tail-based sampling in the collector. Um, and so to, if you want to use one of those components, uh, you have to build a collector that includes them. Um, so the community supports at the moment two distributions. Uh, you'll hear it called core and contrib. Um, the names are a little misleading. Contrib contains all the components that the collector Open Telemetry Collector SIG Special Interest Group maintain in both the core and the contrib repositories, um, which is like, I think we're up to like 100 and some 70 maybe components. That might be too many, but it's a lot. Um, and then core is a much smaller distribution of the collector. It contains um, things that the Open Telemetry Collector community uh, deemed as like bare minimum and the components that uh, had to be included in order to meet um, promises that we had made to other open source communities like Vipkin, Jaeger, Prometheus, Open Census around like compatibility with those um, previous projects. Uh, so those are what the community support, support but the different vendors um, or anybody, it doesn't have to be a vendor, it could be an individual, um, they can build their own version of the collector and throw whatever the components in that they want. Maybe someone built a special component. Um, we have one called the timestamp processor that does special things with metrics. Um, and that's not in contrib. So we have to build our own distribution uh, to put that component in there for people that want to use it. Um, so you might hear stuff like that. Um, basically another distribute, like a, you might use a vendor distribution or some other distribution. It doesn't have to be vendor. If uh, it contains a component that you need that it's not in the community. So that that's like the primary reason that you would use a non-community distribution. Um, what yeah. about like, um, you know, when would someone choose to use the core versus the contrib collector? Yeah. So um, we're, we're talking about this right now, actually, in the collector SIG. This question comes up all the time. Uh, and it's not well-defined. And so there's an open issue to well-define it. Um, you would basically use core um, if, you, if you don't have to do any like super interesting processing. There's not a ton of um, like heavy lifting processors in, the, in core. Like I don't think the transform processor is in there. I'm not sure if the tail base sampler processor is in there. Um, uh, but most of the time, you would probably end up wanting to use contrib because you're going to want to do something and you're going to be like, oh, the component's not in core. I should use contrib. Um, but contrib is massive. Uh, and so there's probably like 100 components in contrib that you don't want. Um, so what we actually recommend is that like the, a best practice um, is to, to build your own distribution of the collector um, that contains only the components that you need uh, that you control and manage. Um, there's a lot of, it gives you a lot of freedom 
Um, it makes your image smaller. It, it makes your uh, surface area of attack smaller. Um, you get to be in control of exactly the things that you you um, use. Uh, the downside is that you've got now you've got to have a release pipeline, right? So a lot of people don't want that. So nowadays, a lot of people probably use contrib in production, but we kind of recommend like our SIG recommends not to do that. Um, but we are working on trying to like solve that problem and not just force everyone to use their own distribution. So it's actually an open issue right now that um, we are trying to decide what does it look like to have a distribution that's specific to Kubernetes. So if you're a Kubernetes user, you don't you want to run the collector on Kubernetes. You don't want to uh, build your own distribution of the collector because that involves a whole release pipeline, hosting Docker images or whatever. Uh, but you also don't want to use contrib because it's too big. Well, what would an image look like that we could support that is specific to Kubernetes? And it has only the things you need to monitor Kubernetes and nothing else. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing some stuff like that as well in the community. Ooh. Okay. That's very cool. How big or not of a lift is it to build your own distro? With just like the that's a good question. I think it's some sometimes it depends on how well you know Go, um, because the tool that does it is a is a Go tool. Um, but personally, I think it's easy. Um, <laughs> there is a, there is a tool that the community we provide. It's actually how we build our own images that we support. It's called the Open okay. Telemetry Collector Builder. Uh, you pass it in a configuration that says this is the component and this is where it is hosted. Um, that's the Go part. Like you have to give the right string that Go will know how to go grab. Um, but you give it, you say, these are the components I want to include. And then you, you run it and it will spit out a binary, but that's only a binary. So the next thing you would have to do if you wanted an image would, would be to go take that binary and build it into an image or Docker or whatever. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not the worst thing ever, but it is, you know, there is some effort to that. Um, so it, we're, we are aware of that in the collective sig that there's, that that is a thing, the whole thing, and so we're trying to make that better. How? Because um, I'm just looking through the the documentation now on the collector builder. Um, how? How straightforward? You might is find it? it better on the website. The oh, okay, okay, okay. In the repository are kind of weak. Yeah, but I'm there not is a, an archive. Yeah, there is on the Open Telemetry website in the collector section of the documentation. There is a building a custom collector section that kind oh. of walks you through how to use the builder okay. and if i could yeah. post links to the chat i would share it but i'll just give it to our host and hopefully they can post it <laughs> yes and awesome okay so the link to the collector builder will be shared shortly as well as the one to the doc that we just referred to um so we did get a, we do have some questions. So let's see. So the first one that we have is, let's see. Okay. The first one is specific to New Relic. So if I can encourage you to reach out to myself um, directly on CNCF Slack. I am happy to get back to you. Um, we do want to keep this vendor neutral. So please um, let me know who this was. Um, I think maybe Grace can let me know who that was. And um, either you can reach out to me or I'll reach out to you. The question next is, what are best practices on sampling? And any comments on sampling events and metrics for business and customer experiences? I, I can't answer that one, but I talked a lot already. So if someone else wants to answer, uh, go ahead. I think I my- I don't have any experience on sampling, so. Okay. Like I've talked about sampling, but um, in terms of like best practices, yeah, I, I don't know, I feel like it depends, but I, I wanna let Tyler chat about this. All right, so sampling, let's start off by saying that sampling is really complicated. Uh, and there's a lot of math involved with it. And it's really confusing. And I work on a team and we have a product that does sampling and 
we have a team member on my team who just like is super smart in the way when he talks about sampling, like I could get lost. Um, uh, the second thing I'll say is that there is a sampling SIG in open telemetry and by SIG, I mean special interest group. So if you're interested in sampling, um, I'd like, like join those SIG meetings because they're really great. And there's a lot of really smart people in there that love to talk about sampling. Uh, so sampling and open telemetry, there's two, well, I guess it's not even an open telemetry thing. There's two main ways to sample. There's something called, um, uh, head-based sampling and there's something called tail-based sampling. Um, head-based sampling is the idea of, um, whatever piece of telemetry you are just like discussing sampling, uh, you make a decision at that time, like when you create that piece of telemetry, um, and when I say sample, I also want to clarify sampling means to keep something. Uh, it doesn't mean to drop it. So when we say something is sampled, that means that it is chosen to be to be kept and like forwarded along. Uh, so head-based sampling. Uh, let's talk about tracing because that's the easiest one, I think. Um, for traces, it's like, okay, I got a span. Will I keep the span or not? that's head-based sampling. I generated a span. Will I actually keep this or, or not? Um, and you can be smart with it. There's, I think the default uh, head-based sampling for open telemetry is parent-based sampling. So at the start, when the very first span in the entire trace, the root span is created, a decision is made. Will this span and all the other spans be remembered? Yes or no. And I think it's random. Um, it, it, there might be some like things in there, but basically it's, Will this entire trace be kept? Yes. And so the span is, that decision is made for the span and then it's passed on to the to the next span and, and so on and it's propagated all the way down. That's called parent-based sampling. And you can get a lot from that. Uh, like that's way simpler than tail-based sampling and you can get a lot of value out of, out of parent-based sampling. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure the SIG right now is trying to uh, work through, the sampling SIG is working through like, can you even replicate tail-based sampling with with parent-based sampling and some like complicated math, which would be super cool. Um, so that's great. But when the trace starts, uh, you have no idea if that trace is going to have an error in it, right? Uh, maybe that maybe your trace has 500 spans and your 499th span has an error. Uh, well, when that first span was created, you had no idea that that was going to error. So what if you wanted to keep that error? It would be random. Uh, so that's where tail-based sampling comes in. Tail-based sampling is the concept of, I would like to make a decision after I've gotten all my data for my trace, um, which is super powerful uh, because you get to look at everything inside the trace, all the spans inside the trace, all the span links, all the span events, all the attributes, and you can make a decision. Uh, the downside is this is really complicated. Um, for the collector, it has really significant um, architectural, like design implications. Uh, like, cause you gotta make sure every single span is on the exact same collector so that the tail-based sampling processor can make a decision. And the collectors don't know how to talk to each other. So you gotta maybe throw the load balancer in front of that. So you sp send the different spans based on their trace ID. It's all pretty complicated. Uh, so my best practice would be um, use uh, the parent based sampling as much as you can. Um, because hopefully that will get you like 80% of the way there. Um, like try that first. And I would only introduce tail based sampling, uh, when it becomes necessary, when you, there's some question you can't answer anymore because parent based sampling isn't working out. Then, then dive into tail based sampling, but the, the complexity of it, um, makes me say my 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 personal best practice is head-based sampling where possible um what about sampling events and metrics for business and customer experiences or do you think that's kind of just dependent on like what they can figure out with using the default sampling so for metrics i don't actually I don't know the spec well enough to know if this, the, there's sampling implications for metrics. Um, 
for metrics, I would say if you've got too many metrics, change your polling intervals. Like if you're if you're generating a, a metric every second and that's just too expensive or it's not useful, like there's there's I, I don't even know if you can sample metrics because you have to do aggregation and stuff, but um, yeah. I would say the, the for metrics specifically, like the first knob to turn would be to produce less metrics and you can produce me less metrics by changing your, your intervals that you like spit those metrics out. You can produce less metrics by turning off certain metrics. There's a, so many metrics that you can generate. Um, maybe some of them aren't actually valuable and maybe you can turn them off. Um, that, that's what I would say for metrics. And then logs is similar to, at least in open telemetry, I'm pretty sure logs is similar to traces where um, you can do head-based sampling, you can do tail-based sampling, you can do probabilistic sampling, um, which is a type of head-based sampling. Um, and I would start with trying not to do tail-based sampling unless absolutely necessary. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I think especially as the more you scale up, the more you have to consider load balancing, as Tyler mentioned, which I know we have the load balancing exporter, um, but I'm sure it can get like way more complicated depending on your setup and the amount of traces that you're generating too. Yeah, the tail-based sampling in the collector almost necessitates um, two layers of a collect of a collector pipeline: a collector to receive the data, and then the load balancing exporter to to intelligently choose where the spans need to go to the next layer of the collector, so that they can correctly tail-based sample. Um, you can you can get away with one really really large collector that everybody sends their data to. That's valid, but it would have to be a massive collector. Um, and you can technically load balance from a collector pipeline back to the same collector and like pipeline and do some fun, funky things like that. But in general, the, the recommendation, like if you went and looked at the tail based sampling processor documentation, it would say like, you probably need two, two lines of collector, the, the one that's exporting and making the decision of where the spans go and the, the one that receives them. There was also a comment, um, the follow-up comment I just saw around orphan spanned or disjointed traces um that that is hard for tail based sampling um like if you have a, a span that's a part of a trace that comes in late that's tricky um so uh, there are solutions to that but the collector doesn't do them today um so like if the collector tail based sampler makes a um it, it's it's waited 30 seconds or whatever and it's received uh, it's got a trace and that trace has been alive for 30 seconds or whatever, it sends that trace forward. It makes a trace, it makes a sampling decision after that 30 seconds or whatever is configured and then sends it forward. Another span comes in for the same trace ID. The collector doesn't know what it made, the decision that it made in the past. Um, so it just restarts the process and you'll end up with like, you might sample that or you might not, um, depending on the decision that gets made. Um, so yeah, late based, there are ways to deal with that there, and there are tools that can handle that type of that type of problem, but it's not implemented in the collector yet. Um, so yeah, that, that type of situation is tricky. Another reason tail-based sampling can be so complicated. Thank you for these questions, um, by the way. Um, yeah, feel free to, if you're watching, I think on LinkedIn or wherever, um, I think you can just comment and we'll see your questions. I think I see a I'm question. Gonna answer. There, I was just going to say there's a question here on uh, approach for removing or redacting sensitive data in OTEL. Oh. And feel free to chime in. But my, my understanding is like you can take two approaches to that. Um, there's like basically two processors that you can use. One's the filter processor, and then um, there is the redaction processor. Yep. And those both live in the collector. Yep. Yep. Um, Tyler, do you have like would, a favorite? <laughs> uh, they, they, there's actually an issue talking about things like what what is like worth leaving in the in the collector right now and what's not duplicated. And right now we see the redaction processor definitely as a standalone. This is important. It shouldn't go away component. 
Uh, the redaction processor is great at um, letting you keep sections of the data that aren't sensitive and mask sections of data that are sensitive. Um, that's its like entire goal. Um, so that that one, like if you have specific needs of like getting rid of sensitive data, I would definitely lean towards the redaction processor. It's exactly why that processor was made. The physical processor is more like, oh, I'm getting a bunch of spans for health checks and I don't want them drop. Um, not that you couldn't identify um, sensitive data in the filter processor and drop it as well, but I like the redaction processor more. And I like even more not generating the data. <laughs> so uh, the redaction processor would be great for like covering yourself. But if you would ever see, oh, the redaction processor hit something, like you should definitely go check out what generated that telemetry and like make it not do that. It is uh, the redaction processor is like a band aid, and you should definitely fix your sensitive data at the source. And you should just really try never to send sensitive data to the collector or just emit it from anywhere. Although, like to play devil's advocate, because could you see a use case where it would make sense to send the sensitive data, redact it because it would be like useful high cardinality data for helping with troubleshooting. Yeah. I mean, I'm making absolute statements in a non-absolute <laughs> situation. Um, so I don't know everyone's use cases. And if, and if there is a use case where like you have a, a piece of telemetry where there's sensitive data mixed in, but the other parts are really important. Um, and, or like for whatever high cardinality reason that you just mentioned, uh, like, yeah, then the redaction processor is going to fit your needs. Um, but you're always putting yourself at a risk that, because you've got to configure the redaction process. You've yeah, got to tell it what true. to look for. It's not magic, right? It's not going to find it for you. Um, so, yeah, you, you're you just at risk, I guess. Yeah, if, if but that, that is a really good work. point. Like, you have to be mindful of, like, I, I think either way, you have to be mindful of the data that you're sending through is, is really the moral of the story. Yeah. I have a question. So I was, I was just looking at the redaction processor, um, because I think I was really only where the filter processor. So stability status is in beta. And I think a lot of components are probably like unstable. Um, can beta you doesn't, doesn't mean unstable, but keep going. Oh, well, yeah, like, um, you know, not like Mark's officially stable. Um, and I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that piece. Yes, yeah, so there's some stability guidelines um, that the collector has landed on um, for itself. And there's actually a larger discussion going along in open telemetry that started kind of recently around um, what kind of stability guarantees can be made outside of the like 1.0 Sember like concept with different um, auto instrumentation packages or, or whatever. Um, and some of it's being based off the collector guidelines. I just shared with our host a link that they'll share with the community. But um, at the moment, the collector has a couple of stable, stable stability levels, development, alpha, beta, stable, deprecated, uh, and unmaintained. Um, at the moment, we are holding ourselves kind of strict about stable. Um, the collector has not had a 1.0 release. Um, it's technically still beta. Um, it's, it's really good at what it does. A lot of people run it in production. Um, it's a great tool, but technically it's not 1.0. Uh, so since it's not marked stable, the components that depend on the collector libraries, we have chosen not to mark them stable as well. Uh, so when you see beta, that's, that's kind of the top level um, component stability at the moment because the rest of the collector hasn't had a 1.0 release. Um, so you should feel pretty confident with beta level components um you know the goal there is supposed to be that their config um won't change and if it will change we guarantee a, a like a deprecation process so that there's time it's not like a oh it took the next release just broke your config sorry um that can happen with, at alpha um but not at beta uh so if you do see a component at beta that's kind of our top level stability right now and you you, if you're willing to use the collector at a beta level, you should be willing to use that component at a beta level. Thank you. That's very helpful.
Okay. Um, we had another follow-up question around sampling. Is it in consideration today to provide an option to sample logs as well as traces? Specifically speaking, if a trace decided, if a trace is decided to be dropped after sampling, the logs belong to that trace can also be dropped. Is it even possible in terms of trace and log pipeline architecture? That sounds awesome. And I am not aware of enough of the uh, sampling um, specification in open telemetry to know if there is um, a current like spec requirement that logs and traces have the same sampling decision. Um, but that could be a, an interesting follow up. I don't think I'll be able to research that right now on the live stream fast enough to answer it. Um, so I can say that there are sampling uh, options like there's a, po a probabilistic sampler in the collector that can sample logs um, and I think it can sample traces but I don't believe that it um, takes into account the IDs in the log um, and the trace and like tries to correlate and make like a group decision I think it just does spans and it does logs and it, that's just it so that, that this, sounds like an interesting idea though with this kind of question um be something like the sampling sig would discuss or would it be something like the logs i think so i think the sampling sig is a is a, a good starting point for any sampling questions okay um yeah so the sampling sig um if you are listening in and you're not part of the cncf slack instance um, please sign up for an account. I will try to find the link so that our host can share it with you. Um, but it is a treasure trove of information that you can search for. Um, you uh, just search like hotel dash and then whatever it is that you're looking for. So like hotel dash sampling, I think is yes. Okay. Hotel dash sampling would be the sampling SIG channel for instance. Um, and then you have like hotel dash comms for documentation, um, hotel dash, I think like Java um, dash collector, etc. And let's see, we had a couple more comments come in. So, okay, let's see. Okay, oh, this is kind of a little bit, um, on what we started chatting about early with the like distros. Um, so organizations sometimes already have vendor collectors deployed, but want to harvest the open telemetry benefits. We know the data collected by the proprietary collectors and OTEL are different. Do you see how the vendors and OTEL community are working together to reduce the differences and allow us to use OTEL collector and only send the data to the vendor backend? Or do you believe we will always have these differences? I have thoughts. <laughs> oh, please. Because I, I, if I interpret the question correctly, I think they're referring to like using a vendor agent versus the hotel collector specifically. Um, and my, I, I'm an hotel purist. So I think that like, if we're going to really honor hotel for all that it is and its vendor neutrality, I would say it would be nice if we dispensed with the vendor specific agents and just all played nice and use the collector to send our telemetry data because then we do leverage the power of, of OTEL so that we can, you know, do those vendor bake-offs if we're considering more than one vendor. Or as Reese said, like if you're sending to to multiple backends depending on your needs, right? You might send all your metrics to one spot and all your traces to another spot and all your logs to another spot. So that's that's my take. So I had some interesting conversations around this because I did have um, some end users ask this question. Um, and so one perspective, I suppose, is like as an end user, um, like what does vendor neutrality really mean to you? Um, and of course, now I wish I'd summarize my notes like I said I was going to do. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna do my best to um, remember what it is that we um, exactly all the different points. But um, so one of the things is 
so I guess we can chat about like why a vendor might want to have its own distro. Um, so one of the things, one of the basic things would be making it, just making it really easy for an end user to just, you know, um, use like our agent or slash distro um, so that you can just plug it in, send your data to this collector. And we already have, you know, all the different pipelines set up for you to send your data directly to us. Um, and, you know, it gives a vendor the ability to add components, whether they're proprietary components um, or community components that will decorate the data in such a way that lights up the experience in that specific vendor backend to give you that out of the box experience that you might get with um, a proprietary agent. Um, so that, you know, I think there are people that would be interested in such a thing. Um, whereas if you want to use completely all community stuff, um, you know, I think there's just like different trade-offs. Um, so like, for example, if you're using a vendor distro and you had problems, whatever kind of problems with it, you could easily get support from that vendor. Um, otherwise, if you're using community components, you want to go to the community and I think support there's no SLA, right? Um, and so I know some SIGs are extremely responsive um, and some might be a little bit more backlogged just you know, due to lack of people or um, you know, other priorities. So I think one of the, yeah, as I was saying, one of the perspectives is just what works best for your situation, what kind of trade-offs you know, are you kind of willing to make in terms of being like truly vendor neutral? I, I think that makes sense if you're talking strictly from like an hotel collector standpoint where like you're basically doing a collector distro that's specific to that vendor. But if you're talking about like these vendor specific agents that are not the hotel collector, I think that's the, that's the thing that I think we should dispense with. Because I, I agree with you, like, Maybe it does make sense to have like a, a, a you know, vendor, vendor distro of the collector because it is still open telemetry. What I dislike is when you're still like, we, we have the hotel collector available to us. Let's build on that. Let's dispense with these, you know, specific agents that had been designed like pre-hotel that a lot of vendors are still pushing on their customers, um, especially if we want to maintain like that vendor neutrality of, of open telemetry and really like want to make sure that we, we develop open telemetry to the best of its ability is, is like everybody rallying around the collector. Yeah. And I'll, and I, the, the specific part here in the question around, um, do you see the vendors in the hotel community working together to reduce the differences and allow us to use hotel collectors and data? Uh, my answer to that is yes, that's totally happening. If you go look at who contributes to open telemetry the most, uh, you'll find uh, monitoring and observability vendors. So there are tons of, of vendors who are like super into hotel. Um, and as a, as a user, when I, when I was a user of open telemetry, that that's what sold me on it. What sold me on the collector was the concept of, Oh, like this vendor supports open telemetry and this vendor supports open telemetry and this vendor supports open telemetry and Microsoft is generating open telemetry data. Uh, and I can just send that to all three vendors all at the same time and, and see which UI I like the best. Like that was a really empowering thought. Uh, open telemetry levels the playing field. It's no longer who can generate the best telemetry. It is who can present and use that telemetry the best, um, which is when I was a user, I loved that. Um, because like, I, like that means that in the future, in, if I want to switch from vendor A to vendor B, it's not some massive project undertaking anymore that involves learning a new UI and re-instrumenting all of my code. It just means trying out a new UI because I can keep all of my open telemetry instrumentation. Um, and I think a lot of vendors are really in on that. Um, there's vendors that aren't, but there's a lot of vendors that really are. And I think more importantly than just the vendors, um, is that there's a lot of large companies that aren't observability vendors that are like, yeah, this project is important and we're going to go contribute to it. Um, there's a link called DevStats and you can go look at 
who is contributing to the open telemetry project and you can look at what companies they work at and there's lots of people that contribute to open telemetry that aren't just from vendors there's people from microsoft and facebook and google and and other large bank companies and there's people that contribute from small companies and insurance companies and from all over the place um so there are there are definitely a lot uh there's a lot of buy-in on the project i, I believe at the moment it's the second most active um cncf project behind kubernetes it is as far as i know unless some other project has yeah snuck up. yeah <laughs> um okay so Hang on. So I see one question, but there is another follow up. So maybe we should do the follow up real quick while we're on the same topic. Um, yeah, the, the follow up sounds like uh, the collector doesn't produce the same data or the instrumentation doesn't produce the same data. And the answer is uh, not yet, uh, but maybe it can. Um, and so if there's something that you like, you have in mind specifically that you wish the collector could support or the individual language distributions could support like if there's a metric missing or there's some piece of t there's some piece of functionality that we don't have yet like open an issue and, and like let's discuss it um and, yes like, and, it's oh, super super helpful go ahead oh i was just gonna say for those who um are not watching from linkedin i'm not sure if you can see the comments but i'll i'll just share it um so the comment is the problem now is that the OTEL collector cannot collect precisely the same data. Sometimes we cannot create the topologies and we cannot use the automatic root cause analysis provided by the vendors when we use OTEL data. Um, for sure, it is something ven the vendor needs to improve, but I believe it is challenging to use just OTEL collection for now. Poke your vendor and say, do better with OTEL. <laughs> yes, definitely <laughs> poke your vendor. Um, Okay, so the next one is, okay, let's delve into an existential question regarding telemetry and its application in troubleshooting business flows, particularly in the context of an e-commerce funnel. Is it possible to optimize telemetry by excluding certain spans when the crucial steps within the flow are not fulfilled? Consider the concept of telemetry in the context of troubleshooting a business flow, such as, oh, sorry, I think... Uh, such as an e-commerce funnel. Typically, telemetry involves collecting and analyzing data points or dot, dot, dot. Troubleshooting business flows. So the root of that question is uh, excluding spans when a critical step aren't fulfilled. So there are ways to exclude individual spans but normally you can like the filter processor lets you exclude them based on the span itself, like what the span looks like. If you want to try to drop a, an individual span based on another span, I don't even know if tail-based sampling will help with that because that's the whole trace. There might be something interesting you can do with baggage and like the way that you instrument your own code where like if this critical thing happens, you add it to baggage and then baggage is passed down the flow to the next span and the span after that and so on. And when that next part in the flow receives that baggage, maybe you can make an interesting decision um, like to not generate a span based on what the, the incoming baggage look like. Um, I don't have any experience doing that and I could be totally off with how baggage works, um, but I think that is possible, but sounds pretty manual. Hopefully that answered baggage passed down the flow. Okay. Hopefully that answered. Um, yeah, I think we're coming up on time. Um, so, oh, oh, never mind. We got that one. Um, you're so welcome. Was there, if you have any last minute questions, feel free to get them in. Um, if we can't get to them, we will reach out to you. Um, and you can find us all on CNCF Slack. Yes. Um, or LinkedIn, I think, right? Or we're all on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. With our new LinkedIn account. <laughs> I won't check my LinkedIn. So message okay. me on the CNCF Slack. All right. So CNCF Slack for, for Tyler. I'm on LinkedIn and CNCF Slack. Reese, 
I guess you're on both. I'm on, I'm on mostly, both. Mostly CNCF Slack. I definitely check that one more frequently for sure. Um, was there anything else that we wanted to chat about? Um, we can always talk chat about community involvement and user working group. Yeah. Um, Unless anyone has any burning questions. Let's see. Yeah, because there's so many things we could talk about um, here, but given that we don't have much time left, um, we definitely want to get to any burning questions. Um, but yeah, we could talk probably all day about the resources we have, how you can get started with contributing if you're interested. Um, there's topics like, how do I get leadership buy-in at my organization to adopt open telemetry? That's one question we've actually seen come up pretty often. Um, but yeah, I, I guess we could chat a little bit about, um, in the meantime, about some of the end user resources that we do have. Um, let's see. So if you are an end user and you are interested in just learning more about the project uh, or learning more about what resources are available to you, check out this link as I get it to our host. Um, oh, there's, yeah, the community. Um, there's an end user space on the opentelemetry.io site that's probably the fastest way to go and see some of the resources that we have available. Um, there's a monthly discussion group where you are welcome to come chat with other end users. We usually have a maintainer or a governance committee member come on to provide additional insight um, about the project roadmap or some of the decisions um, for different components. We have open telemetry in practice, which are teaching sessions um, where we try to have someone come in and do a demo about how they've implemented open telemetry or um, we did have someone from Dynatrace do a session on distributed tracing. Um, that was pretty good. I think we're still working on getting the recording out. Um, or if you're an end user who's already implemented open telemetry and you want to chat with us about some feedback that you have or share your journey, uh, we would definitely love to hear from you as well. Yeah, we're, we're always happy to hear from our end users because I think, um, I, I, I really think our community benefits a lot, uh, a lot from those stories and to know that like there are people in the same boat or who have like been there, done that, I've solved it, this is what you can do. Like our last um, hotel in practice, we had somebody talk about um, their, you know, the fact that the organization that they're at uh, has an observability culture and what it took to, to foster that observability culture. Um, we've got all sorts of, of topics that are covered. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be technical. It can be thought leadership as well. Um, we always encourage folks to, um, you know, who want to share their story, please, please share your stories. And we've had the same people come in for hotel Q&A and hotel in practice. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. If you want to do one or the other, that's totally okay. Um, and user discussions is a great place, like Reese said, to like bring your questions. And because we have experts from the hotel community usually attending, then I find that even we learn some cool stuff while we're there. It's like, oh, I did not know that this thing was happening. So it, they're super useful sessions. Um, check out hotel um, YouTube channel. It's called hotel official, hotel dash official, um, where we used to have like, all of our meetings recorded on there. They're not there anymore. Now we're just posting like content consumable for like our hotel users. So there's some videos that we've posted from the end user working group on that. So if you've missed um, any of our recent meetings like um, hotel in practice, hotel Q and A, you can find those on there and hopefully learn some really cool stuff. And we hope to keep posting content on there. Yeah, it's really um, aimed at helping, I guess, enable um, yeah. enablement on open telemetry for end users, whether or not you are brand new to observability and 
curious about open telemetry or if you're you know a more seasoned practitioner and you want to learn more about open telemetry so a lot of our content is around um, common use cases unique use cases um, and hopefully other cool stuff so, and if there are things that we don't have listed that you're interested in seeing, definitely reach out um, to any one of us and let us know. It could be, you know, a specific topic that you're curious about learning more about um, or a specific like format, um, maybe like a blog post on something that you would like to see or a video, let us know. Or if you want to contribute too, um, everyone's welcome to contribute to the hotel blog. So if you have a cool story to share, it's a great way to uh, to contribute. Even if you're not feeling ready to contribute code, um, contributing a blog post or contributing to the docs is always a really great start. And I'll, then... I'll add that uh, contributing uh, issues is so immensely helpful. Oh yeah, uh, that's true. Like if you experience a problem uh, or you wish that system X, the collector, some distribution or whatever did whatever you need, like like creating an issue is so helpful for us to prioritize like what to work on next. Um, like I, I can say it's especially in the collector, like when end users request something that is that is taken really seriously. Like when, when multiple end users have a feature request, especially when it's multiple, uh, it's hard to deny that that needs to happen. Um, like that, that feature, that bug needs fixed or whatever. So uh, the, not saying that you have to contribute the code fix to yourself or the addition to your, by yourself or whatever, but like just knowing that someone who's using open telemetry wants this thing is so incredibly helpful um, for, the, for the community. And if there's already an issue that's open for the thing, they can like vote on it, right? Or just like add yeah, a comment co to... commenting on it and saying, hey, like we have the same problem. We would like the same issue. Like here's how it applies to our use case. Like when can we have this? Like all of that helps drive priority. It's so useful. Yes. Oh, and yeah. I think the other thing worth mentioning is if you have questions on open telemetry. Um, I, I think one avenue that folks aren't necessarily aware of is that we, if you post questions on Stack Overflow, um, there are folks from the OTOL community who will go through the Stack Overflow questions and assign them to like the appropriate SIGs for to address them. So um, if that's something you weren't aware of, now you know Stack Overflow for your questions. Um, yeah. Oh. I know they were talking about it. I didn't realize that had been more formalized. Yeah, yeah, they are like it, it is being used and there is like some triaging going around and going on around that. So um, nice. the, the more people are aware of it, I think the better because then we've got like a more centralized place where folks can ask questions. I believe there is a hotel dash stack overflow channel or, or I don't know the exact name, but uh, in the CNCF Slack and Stack Overflow posts that have open telemetry tagged or whatever, like automatically show up in there, I think. Oh, oh that's cool. There is. What? Learning so many cool things today. I know. <laughs> well, well, well. Yeah, there it is. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, that's I cool. will personally say that I would love an issue instead of a stack overflow question at the moment um but you are definitely free to use stack overflow if that's what uh you're more comfortable with oh yeah that's fair that's fair i imagine um issues in the specific repositories might get probably get faster attention is that like a probably well yeah because like um, i i spend a lot of time like with github notifications and like i don't have i don't have <laughs> notifications so yeah yes so first step open an issue um or well i guess search and see if the issue has already been open or not add a comment or step two open an issue um and go from there or cncf slack 
Yeah, and, and folks also ask questions on our like hotel and user working group channel. Um, and we, it's, you know, like feel free to post questions on there if you're part of that channel, and then we will direct you to the appropriate person. Um, because sometimes someone just needs a starting point. So we'll make sure at least the right people see your question. Yeah. And we are, oh, dang it. We are just one minute passing now. I was going to be like, oh, we're here. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this session. Um, like we said, feel free to reach out to any one of us um, or all of us on CNCF Slack instance. Um, oh, shoot. I did say I would post a link to um, how to uh, an account. Um, so let me grab that real quick if you want to hang out for a second. Um, but yeah, Tyler and Adriana, did you all have any parting words? Not clever um, enough for that. <laughs> I would say thank you for supporting Open Telemetry. <laughs> Because this wouldn't be possible without people actually using open telemetry. So rock on. Right. What is software without its users, right? Um, okay. So the link to sign up for a CNCF Slack instance account, if you don't already have one, should be shared shortly. Um, so you can reach out to any of us. And we hope to see you around the community. Thank you so much for joining. Okay, now do we just leave? I'm actually not sure. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to say bye and you're like,